On the 15th of May 1970, 18-year-old Olive Walker left home to visit her sister and babysit her nieces and nephews. It was a busy Friday night in Rotorua. Olive greeted several former schoolmates as she walked down the main street towards Malfoy Road where her sister lived. Soon after, piercing screams were heard along Malfoy Road. Olive was never seen alive again. Later that night, her lifeless body was found in a rest area. Olive had been beaten to death with a heavy blunt instrument in an attack so fierce, her skull had been smashed into seven pieces. Rotorua police spent 25,000 hours investigating the murder of Olive Walker. They interviewed 7,000 people and checked 1,800 cars. Olive's killer has never been found. Now two psychics will lead a team of investigators in a search for new leads. The psychics will use their astonishing gifts to relive Olive's last moments and hunt for her killer. I've got struggle in car, so there's a struggle trying to get her into the car. I've had a hit to the head with a crescent spanner. I can't see her hopping in with a stranger. She would have had to be forced. Someone was very determined to do what he did. I'm just getting shivers all over my body, so I'm just following the shivers and... Stop, she said stop. Something over here. She just keeps giving me hit and hit and hit and hit until she is dead. <sighs> Broke her skull. <sighs> and that was it. It was over. Our team has investigated the information provided by the psychics and has come up with some vital new information in the Olive Walker murder inquiry. He's got a tattoo. It's on his neck. He's got dark skin. There's something wrong with one of his eyes. Rotorua's bubbling mud pools and mythical thermal lakes have made the city one of New Zealand's most alluring tourist destinations. Steeped in legend and mystery, Rotorua is the heartland of Māori culture. Olive Oriwia Walker is buried with her ancestors in a sacred hilltop burial ground in Maurea on the outskirts of Rotorua. It's been 35 years since Olive was brutally murdered, but Nahuia Walker still grieves for her lost daughter. The Walker family hopes that one day Olive's killer will be caught. Very important for all of us, um, more so for our mum, because she still hurts deep down. I'm sure she'd die happy if she knew. Olive's father died before knowing the truth. He is buried close to his treasured daughter. We feel that that's what took him away from us, is uh, the hurt he carried all those years. He was the person who'd go up the pub and have a have a couple of hours there or so. But in the end, he just went up there and got him a beer and come home, thinking he was drinking with the murderer. He never, ever once talked about Olive and what had happened. Olive was young for her age and a slow learner. Most of her friends were younger than her. She loved going to blue light discos run by the local police, but she was too shy to dance with boys. Olive's gentle nature made her an ideal babysitter. She always sat there with them and nursed them and played with them and made the bottles. And yeah, she was good that way. Olive had arranged to babysit her sister Mary's children on the night she was murdered. But she didn't reach there. The next morning I got up and turned the radio on and just as I turned it on, the news came over about this girl that was found in the rest area. The, the body was of a young woman and she was lying on her back in an area near a picnic table. Retired detective Bill Beck was one of the first officers to arrive at the lay-by where Olive's body was dumped. 
the rest area was one of several along the edge of the forestry of, of the of the Waipa State Mill area. The body had been dragged some distance, 30, 40 feet, from an area where there had been a pool of blood and that it probably had been when she had been taken out of a vehicle. The difficulty at the time, of course, was she had no identification on her and they didn't know who she was. My dad drove past the rest area and I saw all the cop cars there, not realising it was his daughter. The, the blows were tremendous. Uh, in the post-mortem examination, her, her skull had been fractured into seven pieces. There are no bruisings of the body or the arms of where perhaps uh, she had been generally attacked. It was just completely confined to, to her head. Rotorua detective George Staunton was assigned the Olive Walker case two years ago to follow up new leads and review the original case files. There were spermatozoa located in her underwear and um, on her persons. There is a possibility uh, that she was um, sexually assaulted. Olive's family don't believe that she would have accepted a lift from anyone she didn't know. She was the type to run up the driveway if a stranger stopped. She would have had to be forced. So basically we got a shy, timid girl uh, for no reason was murdered. Olive Walker left her parents' home in Leslie Avenue just before 7 o'clock. It was a chilly evening and she was bundled up in her favourite duffel coat. An hour after leaving home, she was seen outside the Odeon Picture Theatre by several former schoolmates. To get to her sister's house on Malfoy Road, Olive would probably have walked down Amaho Road and ran off street. Not long after she was last seen, screams were heard along Malfoy Road. From indications of the screams that were heard, it possibly came from motor vehicle. Because they were heard in different areas, just not in the one location. Two hours later, at 11.30 p.m., a group of young people made a gruesome discovery. Their car's headlights revealed Olive's partially undressed body. Someone was very determined to do what he did. The pathologist concluded that Olive was killed between 9.15 and 10.55 p.m. She died from massive skull trauma caused by a heavy blunt instrument with sharp projections. One theory is, is that it was a, a hammer, a spanner or a tire lever, but we've never located that item. Police found 11 distinctive footprints at the murder scene. They were from a Kiwi Flex work boot, which were commonly issued to forestry and sawmill workers. Only about 5% of that footwear manufactured was a size 6. So we're looking for a person of shortish stature, small foot. A second major clue was the tyre tracks left by the killer's vehicle. Investigators measured the vehicle's turning arc and determined it had to be one of seven models. Something like 1,800 motor vehicles were um, uh, examined. Inquiries are still ongoing with uh, a lot of those because not all 1,800 motor vehicles were, uh, were actually um, found. When the investigation began, there was over 370 people classified as suspects for one reason or another. There was no one that stood out from the rest. There, was no, there has never been a strong suspect. Forensic examinations revealed semen in Olive's underwear, and the police believe this vital DNA evidence could be from the killer. Police reports from the time said it was likely that Olive was a virgin until the night she was murdered. With advances in DNA technology, all police need now is a firm suspect to match the DNA samples. Next, two psychics will call on the spirit world to help them come up with new leads by returning to the night of May 15th, 1970. It was a fight, arguments, disturbances. 
She hadn't passed over when he left. She was actually still alive. In 1970, Olive Walker's murder shocked and outraged the people of Rotorua. But unlike other high-profile murders, Olive's tragic killing seems to have faded from the public's memory. An Australian and a New Zealand psychic have been selected to investigate the Olive Walker case. The psychics were put through a rigorous testing process. We tested 70 psychics from across New Zealand. A solved murder was chosen for the testing procedure. Presented with only a photograph of the victim, the psychics were asked to produce details of the crime, the location and the killer. Of the 70 psychics tested, only three were able to describe intimate details of the case. Here it is. One of these New Zealand psychics, Adele Dishkam, has been chosen to investigate the Olive Walker murder. Adele comes from a long line of psychics. It's very hard for me to put into words. As a I call myself a spiritual communicator. 100 Australian psychics were also tested. Only five were able to provide intimate details of the case used in the testing procedure. One of these, Deb Weber, will assist in the Olive Walker case. Deb openly lives and communicates with the spirit world. She is a columnist and holds seminars that present life after death as a reality. I actually have images of people come through and they're like a jigsaw puzzle. So I may get the hair and then I'll get the glasses. And then bit by bit it builds a person in front of me. <laughs> Psychics, well, I have to laugh, don't I? There? We've got to use every source or, or type of um, ability available. Uh, if we use it and we come up with something, that's marvellous. If we don't, what have we lost? Well, we'll welcome anything welcome. we can get. Yes. You know. Welcome to do so. We'd love it. The psychics have been told that they are working on an unsolved murder, but they have not been given any details of the case or the people involved. The psychics have never met and have been kept separate from each other at all times. They have been kept under constant supervision to prevent them from researching the case. The production team only confirmed positive statements during the readings, and the psychics were not told the location of the murder. Deb Weber flew from Brisbane to Wellington. She has never been to New Zealand before and has no knowledge of which murder case she'll be working on or where the murder took place. Deb tunes into the spirit world in her Wellington hotel room. She is given a photo of Olive, which she chooses to keep face down. It's a female, it's a woman. Um, woman, woman, not a, not a, she's still fairly young, but not a child. She's a woman, she's uh, got dark hair, brown hair. It actually feels short hair, um, but it's not cropped short hair, it's, but it's short hair. She feels actually quite slender, so she must be about the size of 12, around about 12, 14, 12. Slender, like, um, narrow, what I'm seeing is actually a narrow waist. Like Deb, New Zealand psychic Adele Dishkam has no knowledge of which murder case she'll be working on or where the murder took place. She begins her first reading in a hotel room in Tauranga. Adele is given a photo of Olive, which she chooses to look at. This young lady's taken a little while to actually grow up as a mature. Oh, she's just so beautiful. Calming, very calming for other people. She's still giving me this young energy about her, though, a very young energy still. She was having too much fun in the younger age group. Oh, OK, that's interesting, because she said native to the land. So she was actually a native to New Zealand in her birth, in her birth, native. So if she says native to the land, to me that would be the olive skin. Olivey, olive skin, but not dark, not dark, olive. The word olive is coming to Deb, but she doesn't associate it with a name. She's interesting because she's given me 1970 and then taken me up to 71, so I'm in the cold area in there somewhere. She's getting in there. So sort of in the winter sort of area. Olive was killed at the start of winter in May 1970. She went over or she has gone missing around the time. Close to her birth date, she was celebrating something or organising something to be celebrated. Olive had celebrated her 18th birthday just six days before she was murdered. Her mother's still here on Earth. Her mum's still alive. 
And she said, this is for mum, because mum's never been able to um, rest. I get an incredible level of, she just loved her family, just absolutely worshipped her family. Where did it go? I think this is why it's so important that she's got this pleading for this to be solved, not for her, but for her family. There's a car, because I've got a car and they struggle. I've got struggle and car, so there was a struggle trying to get her into the car. She didn't want to go because she didn't know the people. She didn't know. Can I turn her over, please? Deb looks at Olive's photo for the first time. I'm, I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk. Oh, look. <sighs> didn't want to go in the car, don't want to go in the car. Didn't, refusing, she's fighting going in this vehicle. When it happened, I was going to somebody's place, going to visit somebody's, and I didn't get there. They thought I was late, because I quite often was late. This time I had a real reason, and she's laughing about it. Olive was on her way to visit her sister. She had often been late in the past. Can I have her name, please? Olive, Olive. Olive, Olive, Olive. Olive. She's still showing me the car. Must have been quite late. Because of the tiredness that she's got around her and the lights are on. Even street lights, like she's showing me that it was the street lights were on. And again the car pulled up. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm going to my sister's house. I want to. I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk. Oh no! Somebody. Um, there's something anger. I feel as if she's been hit. He hit her and put her in the car. That's why I've got the dragging into the car. I've had a hit to the head with a crescent spanner. And then now he's in the car, but she's... It's all right, sweetie. I'm not sure what he hit her with, but it was something like metal, like a hammer. You know, like an end of a hammer where you got that metal? It had a handle and hit her with that. Forensics revealed Olive received multiple blows to the head with a heavy blunt instrument. Her chin was punctured in the attack. Police thought the weapon was most likely a hammer, a spanner, or a tire iron. Get off me. Get off me. It's a fight, arguments, disturbances. Listen to me, bitch! It's shut up, bitch. She's saying she was raped. That's OK. But in the car, she's going back from the car. I feel she's trying to tell me that her body was abused during this. Next, the psychics provide startling information about the murderer and the crime scene. I get the feeling as if she's being dumped. He didn't even cover her body up. It was open in the elements, she said. Using only a photograph of Olive, psychics Deb and Adele are able to tune into her spirit and provide remarkable insights about the killer and the crime scene. He knew the town, and he knew that he could just go just out of town to find this grassy area where they stopped. Uh, I don't know why, I feel like I'm on a hill or something, I'm not really sure about that, but I feel like I'm up on high. The lay-by where Olive was dumped was raised above the road. Her body was not visible to passing traffic. It's an important issue, something to do with shoes. Those boots have got a brand, like an issue to do with some sort of company, work, something. Police found imprints of size six Kiwi Flex boots at the lay-by. 
The boots were issued to forestry and mill workers. It's a local person. Lives in the area, she's saying. He's also been in prison or something here because he's actually had trouble before, this fella. I would say, like, a big work environment, something to do. He worked with over... had to have overalls on. Looks like a factory or... You got a sawmill close by. Because I see chips of wood everywhere, like dust. The wiper sawmill is behind the lay-by where Olive's body was found. He's got dark skin, what she's showing me with this fella. Um, and he's, he's, he's either got a scar or something near his eye, but there's something wrong with one of his eyes. It's a bit of a something not right with him. He's not a big man, like, weight-wise. You know, he's quite thin. She says, tell them that he's got a tattoo. It's on his neck. Something here, tattoo, marking. I can see tattoos, yeah. And I can see points that would... So your collar's about there, and I can see points coming up. Still getting overalls, still getting sawmills, still getting dirty hands, short nails. Still got the, something with the eye here happening. I get not her generation. I get another generation older than herself. Somebody that she was supposed to have respected. Yeah, he's seen Olive before. But never spoken to her, just seen her. Olive. He knew that she'd be there. So it wasn't like a random thing. I think he knew what he was going to be doing. Sort of like pre-planned in a way. Two weeks before she was murdered, Olive complained to her family that she was being followed by a man driving what she thought was a Humber. This person is known to her family. She said they know who it is, but they haven't caught him or anything, and he's not a relative. I'm trying to get a name from her, but I just keep getting the Duggan or Doug or something, and then it's interesting, she did say David really clearly then. I get an age of about 37 at when this actually happened. Connected to the mail, not her. It's OK, Olive. Settle down. It's OK. She keeps going into shock. They found that it was the car lights that found her. Because the car came up and had lights on and shone on her. Because you can see someone walking up to her. She's passed by now. She's actually gone. Now, Australian psychic Deb will be asked to identify where Olive was killed. Deb has only been in the country for one day. She has never been to New Zealand before. Um, up here. Take my finger where you want it, Olive. In here somewhere. See the forest. Here, somewhere. In here. How do I say that? That ro ru 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 There, in there. Deb has pointed to the exact spot on the Rotorua Taupo Highway where Olive Walker's body was found. We challenge Deb further by asking her to physically locate the actual crime scene in Rotorua. We start her journey just south of the city, eight kilometres from the crime scene. Deb asks Olive to lead her to the lay-by. On a different day, psychic Adele Dishkam is taken to the same starting point just south of Rotorua and set the same task. Now see, see this here? This is, this is familiar. She feels like she's just back here somewhere. She's not too far, she's just telling me to go back here. Deb has just driven past the lay-by. She was taken down here against her will. Adele is less than 100 metres away. Deb has asked the driver to turn around. Something already happened to the side of the head. This gravel road seems to be significant to her for some reason. Where is that? Where's it gone? Is it a bit further? A bit further. What is that? In the, is that woo? The lay-by is no longer used and is now overgrown with scrub, but both psychics sense when they are approaching. Somewhere around here, Jeb, she's pointing to me. Once more, Deb passes the site and asks to be turned around. But she was just off the road, like she was, they could see her from the road. Something, something back there, isn't it? There's something back there. 
So she's just here off the road somewhere. Somewhere. There's something back there. I feel like I'm on the left-hand side. I've got to keep an eye on this side of the road, the left-hand side coming out of town. Um, and it's just up in here somewhere that she's feeling sick, like scared. Just in here, just here somewhere. Stop. Deb has stopped at the lay-by. Adele has stopped just five metres away. The parking place is on the other side, curving the road there. The, the parking place is, place is just before it. Where we're going, there must be gravel underneath and grass or something on top. Can we go there, please? Next, as their connection to Olive grows stronger, Deb and Adele close in on her killer. Something over there. I need to go over there. Oh, this part's got shivers all over the body. Psychic Adele has found the lay-by where Olive Walker was murdered in 1970. 35 years ago, it was a busy rest area. Now it's overgrown and unused. Something over there. I need to go over there. Adele walks where the killer drove his car. I don't like that spot over there. But I think she's coming up in here. Because she keeps moving up in... Deb's connection with Olive grows stronger and stronger. Oh, this part's got shivers all over the body and she was in this area right here. She, this was a road they could actually drive up because that's where they drove her into here. She couldn't breathe, she couldn't breathe. She was, it was black and she couldn't see much. She's scared to be here. It's, it's, it's scary for her. She's... Um, this is where her body was found, in this area somewhere here. There's abuse. There's abuse to the body. From down, down, here. This bitumen, she keeps showing me the bitumen. I feel she was forced over. She's over here, this way a bit. Can, can Olive, we... show me where you were, darling. No, she keeps taking me this way. Oh, dragging. In here. Just here somewhere. Yeah, Holly, where are we going, sweet? Dragging. She's pulling. Scared. She's scared. Pulling. It's dark. Both psychics are heading towards the area where Olive was dragged from the car. There's the gravel. The gravel that I was... She had gravel. She was dragged along gravel. And I feel that this is the area that she was dragged into somehow. Because the bitumen and the gravel that she kept showing me... And this is like what she showed me, little stones. Tiny little stones that were on her body or something. Stop, she said, stop. Where do you want me to go? Which way? I'm very drawn where that gravel is. I feel as if she was found on that pathway. Sorry, off to one side of the pathway. Don't go up there, she's saying. It's too far up. I have to go in here somewhere. In here, she's saying, go for a walk in here. I'm getting a vision of tyres. A car has driven off the road. There's a car driven off the road and up here. No lights. I can feel it. I can actually, it's like the car's doing it now. The sawmill's just a little way down here. That direction. Where are we going, sweet? That, that direction is the sawmill behind. Sort of towards towns that way. The sawmill's over this way. Deb is right. The wiper sawmill is just over the ridge. She's getting a bit, um, because of the darkness around her, she's getting a little bit lost with her directions, but it was just around in this area here that, that they found her. Ending of a life here, just over here. She's gone back into um, wanting mummy, wanting to be home, wanting to be with family. She keeps dragging me a little bit further over. <laughs> just here, just in here. 
I can actually feel her in here, laying on the grass right here, Bircher. I feel like I might stand on her if I go a little bit too far. Deb is standing in the exact spot where Olive's body was discovered. Adele is just two metres to the left. I would say this is the spot where we're standing here. Olive, come back again, love. She keeps giving me black, just total blackness. Nothing around. I wasn't here for long. Like, there were no animals. It wasn't long enough for any animals to come and be around her. They knew the spot as good as their own backyard. They've been in here before, I feel, to do with their work situation. She's just gone at rest, like at rest, because we're here. She's been waiting for someone to come and just... just uh, understand what she went through. ever really come here and, and people are coming she doesn't want to be here she doesn't want to be here there's people coming she's scared and she doesn't want to be here She's scared and she doesn't want to be here. She doesn't want to be here. Deb was overcome with emotion when a detective arrived at the lay-by during filming. He brought the coat Olive was wearing on the night she was killed. Now Deb is given Olive's duffel coat to see if she can use psychometry to reveal more clues about the killer. There's a tattoo or something, right just behind. Late 30s, 40. Olive. But muscly, because he had to do manual work. He had That was where I get the firmness, I think, from. Adele uses a different approach. She tries to tune into the emotional imprint Olive has left on the environment. That girl was raped. Oh, you took it off me. Oh, it's... Stop it! There was alcohol involved with this person that did it. And he was very aggressive, I would say extremely violent and verbally abusive. Olive's duffel coat has not been cleaned since the night of her murder. Over time, the bloodstains have faded. One big main impact that did the most damage. She just keeps giving me hit and hit and hit and hit until she is dead. Broke her skull, in a way. And that was it. It was over. There is articles that can still be found connected to this lovely lady, there might be something as small as a button. A button did come off Olive's slacks. It has never been found. It's only a small car, but I think he borrowed the car. I don't think it was his car. That's interesting, because it just doesn't match the personality of the car that he was actually in. Where is he, Olive? David or Davies comes in too. David Davies, David Davies, David. So he's still in New Zealand, I feel. But I think it might be South Island. Do you call that South Island? South Island? Because she keeps taking me to stay in the South and saying Island, so South Island. Thin lips, thin, nar yeah, narrow lips. The eyes, it's the, the over sunken in eyes that get me. Roundish face. All right, sweet. Deb has such a clear mental picture of the killer's face, she is confident that she can draw it. She asked to be teamed up with a police identicate expert. Deb is communicating with Olive while she draws the picture. 3.13. I want to get his eyes right. Mm -hmm. Okay. 8.06. 8.06. 
Pretty um, straight eyebrow. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what it is. It's I know nine look like. Similar to the three two three. Yeah, because it looked like it was flat here. You know, a broken nose or something. Look. Okay. Okay, short short over my mouth. I'll just get the basic face. It's not like a, a thin top lip. Okay, so it's the upper lip. Because he had a bit of pouchy bottom lip. Okay, yeah. He's wider. Okay. Square, more square, but it still had that prominent bit. Mm -hmm. It's so close, I guess. Is... Now Deb adds the distinguishing features she saw in a vision. There's his scar. You saw it in the eyes, the eyes semi closed. So that's supposed to be eyelid sort of coming down there. And then there's a bit here, and then the main cut area is sort of down here. Yeah, the tattoo behind the ear. And it's got a small star. And there's some lines in here. There's not many lines, it's just a... 35 years after her murder, Olive, through Deb, is finally able to show the police an impression of her killer. Next, a team of investigators will examine the fascinating new leads provided by the psychics. A picaroon could have caused the two distinctive wound patterns. Rotorua police were immediately interested in the identicate. Psychics Deb and Adele have come up with some interesting new leads, but to solve the Olive Walker case, hard evidence is required. Former detective Duncan Holland heads a team of investigators. Using conventional methods, they have examined the psychics' leads and produced some cold, hard facts. Is there a sawmill close by? I would say like a big work environment. And the sawmill's just a little way down here, that direction. In 1970, more than 200 men worked at the Wiper Mill. The fact that Deb identified a connection with the mill when the original police focused on this workplace is, in our opinion, of real significance. It's an important issue, something to do with shoes. Those boots have got a brand, like an issue to do with some sort of company, work, something. Wiper sawmill workers were issued with Kiwi Flex boots, the type of boot worn by Olive's killer. She just keeps giving me hit and hit and hit and hit until she is dead. Broke her skull in a way. And that was it. It was over. The original pathologist was never able to identify exactly what type of weapon was used to kill Olive. He described it as a heavy blunt instrument with sharp protrusions. There were two distinctive patterns to Olive's wounds. The killer may have used two weapons. One theory is, is that it was a, a hammer, a spanner, or a tire lever. I'm not sure what he hit her with, but it was something like metal, like a hammer, you know, like an end of a hammer where you've got that metal. I've had a hit to the head with a crescent spanner. Based on Deb's premise that the killer worked at a sawmill, we asked the former wiper sawmill manager if he knew of any heavy blunt instrument with sharp protrusions. He said the weapon sounded like a picaroon used to turn logs. We asked forensic pathologist Dr Tim Kollemeyer to review the original pathologist's report and Olive's autopsy photos. If only one weapon was used, he concluded that it was possible that a picaroon could have caused the two distinctive wound patterns. This adds further weight to Deb's claim that the killer was associated with a sawmill. I'm trying to get a name from her, but I just keep getting the Duggan or Douglas. Staff lists from the Wiper Sawmill in 1970 have been destroyed, so we were unable to check if someone with a similar name worked there. Duggan, Doug, Doug. But there is a dug and drive in Rotorua. In 1970, the area was Māori owned farmland, but was a popular place for forestry contractors to park logging trucks, which suggests a further link to the forestry industry. 
Davies. Davies. Interestingly, a search of public records has found that a man with a similar name was sentenced to life imprisonment in the 90s for raping and murdering a young girl and leaving her body in a roadside reserve. We will pass this information on to Rotorua Police and see if the man had any connection to the Rotorua area in 1970. She says tell them that he's got a tattoo. There's also a tattoo or something right just behind. There's a marking here. So your collar's about there, and I can see points coming up. Interestingly, both psychics identified a tattoo with points on the neck of the killer. Deb thought that the tattoo was of a star. He's had trouble with the police, but only on minor accounts, not major. Our investigations reveal that it was common for young offenders at the Waikiri Borstal in Te Awamutu to tattoo themselves with stars. <laughs> The most astonishing lead was Deb's identical picture of the killer as he looked in 1970. That's what I'm saying. It's so close. Rotorua police were immediately interested in the identical. For legal reasons, we can't go into detail, but police confirmed that the picture bears a resemblance to a man who has recently come to their attention for sex crimes committed around the time Olive was murdered. <laughs> police would like it solved. Um, it's 35 years on, uh, the investigation team back there worked really hard on the inquiry, um, hunting down their man, or the men that um, killed Olive, um, and that determination um, hasn't faded 35 years on. My only hope is that that person hasn't been responsible for the same kind of conduct somewhere else. I think it's so important to apprehend the offender and let, let the justice system deal with it. You know, the case will never be closed and, uh, until it's until it's solved and someone's being held accountable for Olive's murder. Olive's memory lives on not only with her mother and siblings, but with the younger generations of the Walker Whanau. Fourteen-year-old Ahinata never met her great aunt, but she knows the tragic story of her short life. For Ahinata and future generations of the Walker Whanau, solving Olive's murder will give closure and free them from a past that haunts them.